physics colloquium series. Um, today we have a little bit of an unusual time for our colloquium, and that's because our speaker, Professor Bridal, is in the UK, and and uh, one one of the great advantages of of um, the world these days is that we can that that's not a barrier to hearing a talk from her. Um, but it does mean that we needed to adjust the time. And it turns out that in this particular case, it seems very appropriate given the topic of the colloquium. Um, but um, I'll just remind you that uh, to, to please keep, your, uh, keep yourself muted during the talk. Um, now, Professor Bridal has, has asked when, when I explained to her that, that we usually hold our longer questions for after the talk and, and accept only ah. short clarifying questions during the talk. Uh, she prefers that we go ahead and ask whatever questions we want to ask during the talk. So um, I will, um, if, in, in some cases you may just jump in Otherwise, I will monitor the chat or, or the raise hand functions, and whenever you have a question, we'll, we'll take it right away. Um, so I'm now going to turn it over to um, Professor Bridal's host, uh, um, Michael Troxell, for a proper introduction. Hi, everyone. Yeah, it's my great pleasure to introduce Dr. Sarah Bridal. Uh, Sarah is a professor of physics at the University of Manchester, where I did my first postdoc with her. Uh, and she's been awarded the Royal Society University Research Fellowship, the Royal Society Fowler Award, and two prestigious research, European Research Council Awards uh, while she's been at, at, at Manchester. Sarah was the founding uh, project scientist for the Rubin Observatory UK, UK Consortium, uh, the, the the consortium that brings UK participants to the, the Rubin Observatory uh, being built by the US. Uh, if you do research in cosmology, it's very likely that you've benefited from one of the tools that Sarah helped make possible. In particular, she was one of the key people that made precision gravitational lensing measurements possible, uh, that made my field possible. Uh, more recently, Sarah's diversified from cosmology into agriculture and food research, motivated by the need to help reduce greenhouse gas emissions. In 2017, uh, she founded the Science and Technology Facilities Council Food Network Plus, bringing together food research and industry with research cap capabilities from astro particle and nuclear physics and the UK's largest science fertility facilities. Uh, she's recently published a book related to these efforts, Food and Climate Change Without the Hot Air. Sarah is absolutely an excellent scientist, uh, but also an amazing mentor and leader. And I hope you join me in welcoming her, welcoming her to the department for a talk. Oh, thank you so much, Troxel. Um, no, really, it's a pleasure to see you and wonderful to see what you've done um, and, and so many things that have gone so brilliantly. Um, and, and I'm really, you know, amazed at what you've, you've done since, uh, since a long, long time ago when we sat in Manchester, when we used to sit in the same room as other people. <laughs> Ah, those were the old days. Okay, I'm going to share my screen and thanks so much for the introductions, um, both from Troxor and from, from Joshua there. And uh, I just to reiterate that I'm, I'm, you know, I what I enjoy about giving a seminar um, like this is hearing your questions uh, and, and answering them um, more than actually sort of getting through my slides. So I promise that whatever happens, I will finish on time. Actually, what time do we need to finish? <laughs> Um, one o'clock would be the nominal time. Okay, uh, one good. hour. Yeah, we've got to be out. We've got to be out of the room <laughs> in an hour. No question. Okay, so I promise I will finish. So you'll be out before before one. Um, but uh, you know, whatever. It's more interesting if if it's answering your questions rather than me just going through my slides, which you know is not as interesting to me. So uh, as hearing your questions. So I'm just going to give a little bit of background of, of, of where I've come from, I guess. Uh, you've heard of it already. I'm most, most comfortable giving talks um, which start with this picture um, of gravitational lensing and looking at um, the bending of light by gravity, which you all know all about because you've got some of the world experts um, with you there. So um, no more to say about that. But uh, just to say that this actually 
sort of this, this, these connections to this topic go a long way back, back to when I was at school, um, back at, which, at, at high school, I think you say in the US. Uh, when I was about 16, I was trying to decide what subjects to study. And I was very lucky to be taken around Cambridge by a friend of my dad's. Um, he took us punting on the river and uh, and, I, and showed me how to derive the um, the equipotential surface of the the earth due to the tides from the moon and I was just so excited about it I really wanted to study physics and that's that's where it all began and so um, cut cut to a, a long story short um, for me the most exciting thing that I've been involved in was um, getting the first results from cosmology from the dark energy survey. Um, was the culmination of many years of effort by many, many people and a, a huge amount of fun sitting in rooms late at night with, with Troxel and the group there um, trying to figure out what was going on with this data set. And I applaud the people who are continuing doing that right now. I, I dread to think what it's like. Um, but it was, it was a, I look back on it with huge fondness. And uh, it's funny how time cures all of, the, all of the issues that one can have at the time. So um, it's, it's a wonderful, wonderful time that we had doing all of that. And uh, so when that was done, you know, I guess I should have felt really happy um, because it was really the culmination of all the dreams I'd ever had about, about cosmology was to go all the way through the pipeline from galaxy shape measurement to cosmology um, and to, to, to put all those things together. Um, and, and the dark energy survey, which had taken, you know, 10, more than 10 years by that point to, to get the first results. But strangely, I was kind of in this sort of strange place in my life that I was a bit confused and, and my kids were sort of, you know, just starting school and I, I just try to work out what to do with the next 20 years. And uh, many things happened around that time. But uh, one of them was that I bumped into is my, my kids uh, now at school um, and uh, I bumped into a former mentor of mine. Uh, David Mackay, who had taken me and my dad around Cambridge many, many years ago, and he'd um, had a quite an interesting career in computer science, a world leading computer scientist, but also um, he had, had made a very unusual transition into learning about climate change, wrote this book, Sustainable Energy Without the Hot Air, which was incredibly influential, and he became um, chief scientific advisor to the UK government. Uh, for the Department for Climate Change um, at that time. And I mean, I wasn't really that much in contact with him at the time, but I was at a, a dark energy survey, a collaboration meeting in Cambridge, and um, I bumped into him riding his bike very much like this. And he said he had some health news. And uh, it turned out that he had terminal stomach cancer and just uh, only lived about six months after that. And this really made me kind of just wake up and think, wow, I'm so lucky to be here. And, you know, so wanting to do something useful with the fact that I'm actually here and able to do something and really humbling to sort of think, you know, what can I do um, to try and help about climate change? And I guess I also pictured my kids kind of in 20 years time saying, what did you do about climate change, mummy? And me saying, hmm, I looked at the stars and thinking, I've got to do a bit, a, a bit of something on this. So that was that was my starting point. And it gave me a real focus to try and figure out what, what to do. So I started to learn about about our planet, um, which I hadn't honestly thought much about before. I wasn't I wasn't a sort of, you know, eco kid who was always thinking about you know, um, the good, good things for our planet. I was more interested in the stars and so on. So, uh, yeah, so this is, is a really nice graphic that I found illustrating climate change. I don't need to tell you, I'm sure, about, about climate change, but this is a really fun thing. If you type into Google climate stripes, then um, you'll find lots of different versions of this um, graph, which is showing the mean temperature since 1850 uh, and one stripe for every year. And so I guess, you know, it, it's you can actually get it printed onto bags and ties and leggings and, you know, and any any accessory you want pretty much if you want to buy stuff, then uh, then this is quite a fun way of starting a conversation about climate change. <laughs> There's not very many of them, so I grab onto anything I can get. And uh, so this is a lovely illustration. And, and I guess you can ask people, do they think it's kind of bluer on one side and redder on the other? And most people agree that it, it probably is. Um, and I'm sure I don't need to show you this graphic of, of carbon dioxide concentration over the last uh, sort of how it goes up over the last um, 150 years. And that spike that you can just see attached to the end of this 
oscillating function, but you know, global warming and, and astronomers don't need to be reminded about the um, the effect of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere blocking infrared radiation, since we're, we're tr often trying to see through the atmosphere to see what's on the other side of it. Uh, we know that the atmosphere and the carbon dioxide is blocking um, thermal radiation and, and therefore keeping us warm. I don't need to tell you about that, I think. Okay, so um, I got interested in food. Uh, I'm just looking for the slide on that. Here we go. So. Um, if we look at climate change, then it turns out about a quarter of all climate change is caused by food. And that covers all these different stages of clearing land for agriculture, um, growing, uh, growing plants, including particularly putting nitrogen, nitrogen on the soil to fertilize them. And um, we've got all of the farming kind of processes of, of using petrol and so on, um, gas, I should say, on the farm. Um, and then processing that, those foods, transporting the food, um, you know, energy use in supermarkets, including fridges and freezers, um, all the way to the consumer and cooking. That adds up to about a quarter of all greenhouse gas emissions. And so, I mean, we do need to sort out the other three quarters. But if we were to stop burning fossil fuels, for example, then food would be the biggest contributor to climate change. And if we look ahead 10 years, then hopefully uh, we might hope that we're going to massively reduce our use of fossil fuels. And at the same time, we have a rising population, which is on average eating more and more greenhouse gas um, unfriendly foods. And so this red part is increasing in size. And so my sort of um, my guess as to what's going to be the most interesting thing to do on climate change in 10 years time is, is that it's food. Now, of course, maybe it's not such good news. Maybe we don't cut back on fossil fuels, in which case we're gonna have massive problems with climate change impacting food. Um, so impacting what food is available and what harvests we can get and what extreme weather events do to our food system. So one way or another, I decided that food was the most exciting thing to look at in terms of climate change. And if you want to know a bit more about where that, those numbers come from, you can study this diagram in as much detail as you like. This is um, from one of the IPCC reports. That I'll share the slides after if you're interested. But you can see the different uh, sectors here on the left. So you can see the diff different contributions to food and you can see things like heating um, and, and um, transport and so on there. So you can see that food is a major contributor and you can stare at this for hours looking at all the different uh, types of, of, of ways we can break this down, for example, into different types of um, gas that we've got here. And so you can see the fossil fuels causing the majority at the moment, but these food related items, they're not going to go away, even if we switch to renewables. So this is why it's, it's, it's really interesting to me. Okay, so we're going to move on to a few polls now, because I want to hear your thoughts and your questions about this topic. Um, so do just type away as soon as you've got a question and I, I won't I won't stop and start all the time, but I will will gradually weave some answers in, hopefully, into what I say. But first of all, I guess I'm not going to do a poll on this one because you can probably guess which do you think causes the most greenhouse gas emissions out of um, an eight ounce steak and chips fries, I should say, um, or a microwaved potato and beans. So um, you might be able to guess which way around that is. What's the difference, do you think? So do you think it's like twice as bad, 10% different, 20% different, twice as bad, 10 times as bad, 100 times as bad? What's your, what's your guess about the ratio between the greenhouse gas emissions from those two things? You can type that into the chat and I shall, I shall attempt to summarise your, um, your answers. So we've got a 20 there from Eric, two from Dan. Yeah, I won't read out all your names, I guess. You might not want to be high, <laughs> highlighted like this. Got a range here, yeah. Got a, I'd say we've got a range from about 1.5 up to 40 going there. Ten's quite popular, excellent. Okay, um, so research has shown that people generally know a little bit about the relative, um, they know about which things are generally more climate unfriendly than others, but they often massively underestimate that the size of the difference. 
Um, so we've got, um, you know, we've got a good range here. And on average, globally, if we look at global averages, then it's a, over 20 times different um, in between those two. So, so you're getting pretty close there with a lot of those answers. So that's that's really great. And I've also put on here the um, global average emissions per person per day from food, and I've halved it on the basis that we're trying to halve emissions by 2030. So this might be a kind of budget that we're aiming for. So you could see there that the steak um, and fries is, you know, we've blown the budget on this one meal alone and we've got the rest of the day's food to fit in if we're trying to, trying to stick to this budget. So that's about, the, there's a lot about quantities here, isn't there? Do we need an eight ounce steak? Maybe, you know, maybe we could, you know, maybe four ounces would be enough. Um, and maybe, you know, maybe that's something that we could just share it with someone else and bulk out with lots of vegetables. And, and you'll find that it doesn't make a big difference if we bulk out with a lot of vegetables, um, if, they're, if they're relatively local, that is, um, if they've not been air transported, that is. Um, any questions on that? I've got, there's lots of information I've just given you there. Any questions? Sarah, I was yeah. so curious. So you think about, you know, we hear about these new synthetic steaks we think that people might make, right? And so, if you were to break down where most of that was coming from, is it because of methane from cows or because of not of using land somehow? Or what's the actual breakdown of what, what's causing the issue? Excellent, great question, yeah. So for this global, global average number I've shown you here, that about half of it is coming from the methane. Um, so cows, about 5% of all the calories eaten by a cow are burped out again as methane. Um, and methane is about, well, 10 times more potent than carbon dioxide per carbon atom, um, which I think is the relevant quantity here. So, so methane is about, about half of this. We've also got manure management on the farm. So if that manure is stored up, um, then it will contribute more methane because it's um, rotting in a, um, a, a, an environment that doesn't have enough access to oxygen. And also in the global average numbers here, I'm showing you there is also some land use change, um, which as in deforestation. The numbers vary hugely um, between different places. So if we're getting that meat from Latin America, and if that has come from a deforested region, then the number's going to be four times higher than the number I'm showing here. On the other hand, if that meat has come from a relatively um, efficient system, which means that the cows don't live for too long, they're fattened up quickly, which would be more typical for US meat production, then it could be half what I've shown here. So that's a great question. And, and some of that, um, that halving, it also depends on whether it's um, from a dairy uh, herd or from a dedicated beef herd. So if you're taking meat from a dairy herd, then you're, you're sharing those emissions out between the meat and the milk. So you can reduce the emissions by another factor of two if you do that, pretty much irrespective of the system. But often when we buy meat, we don't know. And certainly if you're having a steak, you're probably not going to get that from a dairy herd because it might be a bit chewy. Um, yeah. <laughs> Great question. So you mentioned that the steak is fried and the, you know, the fries are obviously fried in oil. The, the beans and potato were microwaved. If you microwave the steak and fried the beans, would, <laughs> is, that, is that negligible on this scale? Yeah, it is. Yeah, that's a good question. Yeah. So if you look at the potato emissions, that does include the cooking and the, the, be the beans as well from heating those up and the canning and everything that's all in there. But obviously, if you, you know, so yeah, if you halved, if you, if you didn't cook the potato, which obviously wouldn't be a good idea, but if you didn't cook the potato, then you might at most halve that number. So you can see that's a tiny amount compared to the steak, uh, the total quantity for the steak. Yeah, that's a good question. In fact, as we were talking there, right on cue, my beans and potato have arrived for my dinner. <laughs> this was not planned. <laughs> but we, we see the potato at 227 and the fries at 643. Is that difference of two basically just because of how you cook it? Uh, okay, yeah, so it depends on where you've got the fries from. So if they've been processed, there's a bit of processing uh, emissions there. And obviously it depends what kind of fuel you've used for that processing. And then the cooking is in there, but it's not really to do with the, uh, I mean, it's not, yeah, it, it's, it's largely the processing and that will vary depending on how it's processed. Excellent. Okay, great. Okay, so I'm gonna do a, a poll now. Um, different poll. 
So my question for you is, um, which do you think causes the most emissions out of these options? And I guess you can start to be thinking about, about how different these options are going to be. So a spaghetti bolognese with beef, a spaghetti bolognese with chicken, uh, the same amount, and a spaghetti bolognese with, with, with tinned lentils, canned lentils, instead of um, uh, the, the same quantity of chicken. So I want you to guess and put, put, put your votes in the chat. But if you've got questions about this, you know, you might want to know more details about these options, then do put those in the chat and we can talk about that as we go along. I guess I'm looking for beef, chicken or lentils in the, in the chat. And, and the, excuse me, and the question is, which one uh, has the most or least? Oh, sorry, yes, good question. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, Calvin. Yeah, uh, which has got the most? Yeah. Great. I can see lots of answers coming in now. Okay. Oh, we've got, uh, we've got a ratio here. This is exciting. Okay, wow. Okay, we'll be able to test this out when I, when I show you the answer then. Nice, I'm liking these ratios. Okay, let's, shall we, shall we see how we're doing on that? We'll see, see which, which one wins out first. So let's see, so we've got the beef, uh, you, 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 most of you said beef, so well done. So we've got the beef there, we've got the chicken coming out next, and then we've got the lentils coming out. Now I'm just thinking, what's that ratio? That's a, that'll be kind of roughly six to one, I guess. So I think uh, burnt, uh, get, wins the prize for the best uh, ratio there, but Dan's pretty close there. Um, and obviously, I've not I've rounded off rounded things up horribly. So maybe maybe you're closer than I'm giving you credit for, Dan. But I mean that's pretty spot on. Uh, so and it does depend where the beef comes from, as we just said. So um, so that that could definitely be a, a correct answer. Uh, okay, so where do we stand with this? So what do you make of this? We've got we've got the beef making up a large fraction of that. We've got, if we switch just the, if we look at the beef versus the chicken, then we're looking at a factor of nearly six in terms of just the, the meat component. For the lentils, I've also put in the, the, the steel can because I, I was, I worried a bit about that at first because, you know, you think, oh my goodness, lentils, that's going to be a right faff cooking everything up from scratch. I'm going to be cooking things for, you know, from the day before and I don't want to do that but I can cope with opening a can of lentils. So, you know, that's that's a bit easier. Um, I guess you can also in the back of your, you can in your, your heads do the calculation. Supposing you halve the amount of beef and added, you know, lentils in, you'd obviously get somewhere halfway between the two, wouldn't you? So that would make a huge difference compared to the beef number already. Next, oh, we've got, we've, got a, we've got a more accurate version here with the exact numbers. Thank you very much, uh, Chen Hao. Excellent. Okay. So is this somehow averaged over? So if you get spaghetti from from Italy, you buy a <laughs> box of Checo spaghetti. It's probably a lot less. I don't know. It probably comes via cargo ship or something to the United States, right? Is that problematic on the on this scale? Because I really love the Checo spaghetti. So I. <laughs> Excellent question. Yeah, good. So it turns out. So like when I started on this, I was like, okay, I. I I'm just curious about climate change. I'm curious about my food. And I just want to do a quick calculation of the greenhouse gas emissions of what I ate yesterday. I'm just going to Google it. And I'm like Googling it and then Googling it. And I'm, I'm just finding out that like vegan diets are better than omnivore diets. And I'm finding out vegetarian diets are better than omnivore diets, but I'm not finding all these numbers. And I want numbers, right? We, we're data geeks on this call. So we, we, we want the numbers. So it turns out that basically the numbers aren't there. The numbers are really hard to find and I spent basically three years reading academic papers in the literature to find these numbers. And so you find like one paper on spaghetti and you'll find another paper on kind of, you know, um, vegetables, maybe if you're lucky you'll get a whole paper with lots of different vegetables. Um, so it's it's really quite difficult to find these numbers. And that's why I end up writing a book. So I'm like, well, you know, I've done all this work now to figure all these numbers out. I'm, I'm damn well putting it here so that no one else has to go through this agony again. And of course, most of these 
these numbers in the papers are behind paywalls. And you have to search through, you know, the, the supplementary data to find out the great questions you're asking about, you know, what fraction of that is from the tin, or the can, and what fraction of that is coming from the methane and what fraction, you know, we want these numbers. Um, and just to, just to be clear, the, the book is, is free ebook, so that you don't, I'm not asking for your money here. Um, just uh, if you want the want all the details, then it is it's in there. But you know that that was that was where I was coming from. I wanted to know these questions. So to answer your specific question, um, so traveling by boat is is usually not significant compared. I mean, it's usually similar or or, or smaller than the um, greenhouse gas emissions from producing the food. Um, so I don't think you need to worry about getting this 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 fancy pasta from Italy, Chris. Um, I think you're OK on that. And, and if we look at, you know, how big the spaghetti number is there, um, that's 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 not huge anyway, is it? So, you know, I think I think you're fine. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, on the other hand, if you're having an air freighted emergency delivery of, of, of the spaghetti, that would be an issue. So I'll, I'll, I've probably got a slide on that later on. But yeah, I doubt you are. Uh, we're going to do another another poll now, um, which is about um, hot drinks. So if we compare a coffee with milk and sugar or a black tea or a latte. Um, so which of these do you think causes the most the most climate change? Okay, we've got a few coming in now. Oh, we've got some ratios, excellent. Great. <laughs> I love this. <laughs> uh, no one else has come up with ratios before. I'm loving it. Okay, right. So we've got a lot of votes for the latte and we've got some ratios and I'm not sure which the ratio is correct. So let's find out. We've got one for the coffee. So that's good to have a bit of variety. Okay. So I think Christoph is pretty much on the money here with the, with the cow's uh, comment. So <clears throat> here's, the, here's the results. Now, first of all, this is on the same scale as the previous charts I showed you. Okay, so we've still got this, um, this, this metric here on the right-hand side of this, this, um, this target. So, you know, these are all relatively small compared to the dinner options. Um, so on the other hand, um, Christoph has pointed out if the, if the cows are dominating everything, then it's probably the latte. And what you can see is that really it's, it's this milk in this latte which is causing most of the issues. So I've assumed 500 milliliters of milk in this latte. Um, so it's basically milk with some, some coffee shots, I guess. Um, so this is, this is, you know, a significant fraction. It's all about the quantity of milk because actually this cup of coffee with milk and sugar, um, you know, we've got milk in it, but it's not a big deal, right? Um, we're not seeing the milk as being a huge contributor there. So when I first heard about this, I freaked out, I went vegan. I was just like cutting everything out that I could think of. But actually having a bit of milk in, in, in a cup of coffee, if it's, if it's a tablespoon, like in this case here, it's not a big deal. On the other hand, we could go super minimal and have this, this cup of black tea with, with boiling very carefully, only the water we need, and we'd be right down. But these are already pretty small numbers. I've not done the calculation. So what's the ratio? Well, we've got kind of if we've got kind of got one, if we call this roughly one in the middle, and we've got like 10 on the left and maybe a hundred on the right. So so I think I think we've got quite an extreme ratio here, haven't we, compared to, to your your suggestions there? And it's all coming down to the amount of milk, as Christoph has said. Excellent. Great. Uh, okay. Can I ask yeah. you a question? Please. Why yeah. is why is the boiling water for coffee cost twice as much as with tea? Great. Okay, good. So what I've done for the tea calculation is I've assumed that we're boiling about twice, well, just over twice as much water as we need. So this is assuming we're boiling half a litre of water um, as opposed to actually putting in the exact amount of water into the kettle. Okay, and that's thank you. Based on studies of what people do. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I apologize for the question. I have a question from the previous slide. I mean, you may have answered it, and it's about the uh, the tomatoes, the canned tomatoes. Why is that so high? Great question. Yeah, thanks. So, so the canning process involves heating things up. And um, uh, for, for some period of time, and it also involves the um, treatment of all the steel. Um, so we've got, you know, 
actually, sorry, the, the steel is the steel can uh, I have included in that can, can tomatoes calculation there. So that includes the treatment, includes the heating up. The calculations were done um, for that, that, those calculations are in the literature. They were done about five years ago using the, um, the, the energy mix at that time for the, for the electricity and also for using fossil fuels at the plant. I think that could be done for you know, much less if we were to use renewables for that energy source. But on the other hand, if it's done using fossil fuels, then as, as apparently we are about to build some coal mine in the UK for producing steel, apparently, or hopefully they've cancelled it by now. But um, yeah, that, that's, that's all to do with energy usage. So this is the case then for any canned good. Is there a savings by, by buying frozen vegetables and using those? That's a good question, yeah. So I haven't done that exact calculation, but I'm very curious now you've, you've asked about it. Generally speaking, the freezing is not a big deal. Um, so we can do that calculation of the specific heat of water and, and, and we, can, we can calculate that, that energy. Um, so it's, it's, it's generally not a big deal. So I think that frozen would be good. On the other hand, um, I did buy some frozen uh, chopped tomatoes once. Um, <laughs> and I, I, I suspect that probably that's not terribly efficient because you've got the transportation. They hadn't been, you know, they hadn't been boiled down and concentrated. So I'm using tomato puree these days in my uh, recipes because you've got also you've got the concentration. And so if you're going to concentrate stuff down, that's going to be less transport as well. So uh, admittedly, there's processing there. So, yeah, I'm bulking out my tomato sauce. Don't tell the kids, um, but I'm bulking it out a lot with some onions and carrots from our local veg box. So there's not really a lot of tomatoes in it. So that's that's my solution at the moment. But yeah, a good, good question. Thank you. So you're going to give us your recipe for spaghetti bolognese with lentils? <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I, I'm a bit extreme with my, uh, yeah, I won't, I won't bore you with my, my recipes. I'm not sure. Basically, if I cook something these days, my kids, it's something they haven't had before. They're like, where are the lentils in this, mummy? <laughs> so I've just, I'm getting really into yellow pea flour at the moment because you can also grow that in the UK. And uh, so yellow pea flour, you can do quite a nice pizza base, it turns out. If you, if you it's called farinata. So we're not calling it pizza, we're calling it farinata with toppings because I don't want to get it compared with the shop pizza. Anyway, you can just mix that up with water. A um, bit of rosemary is quite nice, bake that. And then that's your protein. You've got your protein in and it doesn't even look like you're eating lentils or, or, or peas. Anyway, I could go on for hours, but that's, uh, yeah, <laughs> that's what I'm doing. But it, it does raise a question, which if I may be getting ahead of you here, but... Um, <laughs> We hear so much about um, how we should be buying local, um, but I've also heard that you know the the transportation cost per pound of bringing you know strawberries from California to the East Coast is actually negligible compared to the cost of a farmer, um, you know, twenty miles away bringing his or her small amount to a, a local farmer's market. Correct. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, yeah, so the whole, let's talk about, let's talk about food miles then. So the person that coined the phrase food, do you use the phrase food miles in the US? No. Okay, let's talk about local food. Um, so local food is often sort of touted as a sort of solution to all our environmental problems. And as you correctly say, uh, the transportation, um, if, as long as it hasn't come by plane, the transportation is generally negligible or, or not terribly important in terms of climate change. And in fact, you can, as you say, if you're driving yourself to your local farmer's market um, and then buying, you know, a few things and then coming home again, then your, your fossil fuel emissions from driving your car will definitely be much bigger than, than the transportation of those, those things from overseas by, by boat, unless you're buying a huge amount. So, um, yeah, so the local thing. So why am I talking about growing local pea, using local peas? So um, we also, I'm thinking about resilience um, and I'm interested in the fact that the UK actually imports about half its food and that's increasing as, you know, it's increasing with time and it doesn't seem like a very good idea to be outsourcing, you know, food production to that extent. 
And if we're going to have food system shocks like pandemics or um, climate change, then for me, local food production is about resilience. Um, and it's about also knowing the people who have actually grown my food and being connected to it. It's not really about climate change for me. Um, so that's that's my my logic there, because I'm we're also trying to do a local food growing project um, and uh, we're, we're experimenting with what what pulses we can grow in our local areas and getting people growing stuff on the windowsills and everything. I could talk for hours about that. But it's not, not technically. Uh, yeah, it's kind of a hobby. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. So yeah, you're completely right. Great. Okay. So but I, about... I have a quick follow up though, right, um, right. if you don't mind. Yeah, sure. I, I mean, buying local to me is a, is a way to remember and recognize or be in tune with, if we want to get spiritual sounding, uh, the seasons. So I'm wondering, I mean, if you're buying out of season things of produce, then you are shipping presumably uh, maybe over freight, but also by plane. And I wonder if that makes a significant difference. Yeah, so let's talk about the plain stuff then. So, so, so if things are coming, um, if there are seasonal things coming, then the chances are that they're perishable. So if we talk about those strawberries, for example, um, certainly in the UK, if we have strawberries in the winter, they've been flown from um, at very least the south of Spain, if not the north of Africa. So they've, they've come by plane because strawberries don't last well on a boat for several weeks. Um, generally berries would be in that category. Um, if we look at something like um, apples or bananas or oranges out of season in the UK, then apples from New Zealand, you know, the other side of the world for us, it's not a big deal that the transport is not a big deal. So having apples out of season um, is not a big deal in terms of climate change. Um, and apples actually often um, things that can come by boat often store very well as well. So apples out of season could equally be from the UK, but just stored for six months. So yes, I totally am with you on this though. I love the fact that that things change with the seasons and it's it's just wonderful to be connected with, with some of that. And when you think about the fact that actually one third of food is lost or wasted globally, um, and that's that's actually in the U in countries like the UK and, and I should think the US about 70% of food waste happens in the home. Um, and so that's about us, you know, maybe um, not necessarily planning ahead or it's, you know, there's lots of reasons why we waste food, um, but, it, you know, and we all do it. But on the other hand, if we actually are more connected with where our food comes from and we appreciate how hard it is to grow the stuff, then I think there's a bigger chance that we're, we won't be throwing it away. And certainly I hope my kids are going to be, you know, appreciating the things that we, we're picking from, from locally when we've put all our hard work into producing them. Thank you. Pleasure. Yeah. OK, so you've all had a bit of time to think about this question now. So I guess we can go with the ratios question because you can probably guess the answer to this already, which causes the most climate change. Oven cooking for one, uh, putting the jacket potato in the oven for two hours, cooking for one person, um, oven cooking for two people or microwaving this potato. So this, I guess, is about the cooking options. So I don't know, do you want to go ratios or just want to guess which, which causes the most climate change? I think you can probably guess this one, can't you? Should I just give you the answer? OK, we're going, we're getting, we're going ratios. OK, great. Excellent. <laughs> Excellent. Okay, now I, I have to be honest, I haven't done is, the ratio. Is the oven electric or uh, gas? Good question. I'm assuming electric and I'm assuming a global average for the energy mix, but that might be better in the US than the global average. And certainly if you've got a gas oven, then it'll be, it'll be more, it'll be worse than the, glo the, 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 the global average energy mix. And I guess we should also be commenting on whether, have we, have we put the oven on and then turned the heating down uh, to compensate for the fact that we're heating our kitchen already? Um, or have we just left our central heating on? So I'm assuming that we have not turned the central heating down, uh, that the heating of the house down because we've, we've, we've warmed up the kitchen a bit through the oven. <laughs> okay, we've got a few answers coming in here. We've got some brave guesses at these ratios. Excellent. Okay, shall I, shall I um, reveal? Here we go. Okay, so we've got, I think I think you're pretty much 
a lot of you are guessing this this ratio of a of, of factor of two between the oven cooking for one and the oven cooking for two and I guess I didn't really specify what toppings we had on this jacket potato but I was assuming that we had a bit of cheese and butter as well so so that 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 slightly narrows that ratio a bit but it is it is largely dominated by the oven here and so when we cook for two people then we, we are mostly halving those emissions I've also I reduced the amount of cheese on this on this uh, this middle version and switched from butter to vegetable spread. So it is is roughly a factor of two. Um, and then when we switch from the the oven uh, cooking for two to the microwave, um, then let's see we've got what's that a factor of well over three. So yeah, so I guess we're we're somewhere between Joshua and Ryan there on on that ratio um, from the middle one to the to the right hand one. And I guess we can also talk about how this compares with this global, av global average uh, budget per day, we can see that if we cook the, the potato for one person, then we've already blown our daily budget. We, we're not allowed any other food in that day. Um, and certainly when I first um, heard about the impact of food on climate change, I went vegan. I probably stood there unpacking my suitcase from the US um, with my oven on for two hours. My jacket potato is in the oven. Maybe I drove to the shops to buy some green beans, um, which had been air freighted from somewhere else. You know, I was being vegan, but I wasn't, you know, it wasn't particularly great for the climate. So that's what I find fascinating about this is that it's not as simple as, as, as a, a dietary choice like that. It's actually, you know, far more interesting. Cool, okay, uh, great. And I guess here in this micro potato with beans one, I've also just removed the cheese completely and I've added in some veg, some sort of pickle relish, whatever you, you call it uh, in the US. Do you use those words, pickle, relish? I don't know. <laughs> okay, we'll go with that. Excellent, okay, so we've still got room in our budget. Now, what can we do about all of this? Um, well, I'd love to see labeling uh, on foods. I wanna see these numbers. I wanna see the data. I'm a data geek. You can see a thumbs up from Ryan there. So, you know, I would love to see these numbers. Now, it turned out that actually this did happen about 10 years ago, there was, a, there was um, Walker's crisps uh, so this is this is chips to you. Um, so some packets of chips did have some numbers on in the UK um, about 10 years ago. And guess what? It was like 50 grams of carbon dioxide equivalent per packet of chips. I wouldn't have known what that meant. I wouldn't have known if it was a big number or a small number or, you know, uh, worrying or, or anything. I wouldn't have had a clue what to do with that number if I'd seen it on my crisp packet 10 years ago. Um, so not surprisingly, maybe um, they stopped doing it because nobody cared. It didn't didn't give them any market advantage. So this is a big challenge that we face is that, you know, if we want people to do this, if we want companies to do this. They do have a lot of this data nowadays, but they're not getting that you know demand from consumers to have this information. And it's not mandated by governments. So um, here we go. This is this is here we go. 75 grams of carbon dioxide equivalent. So all these numbers I've been showing you in these slides, these you know these in principle could be on the packets, right? But it's kind of a bit chicken and egg if you don't if you excuse the food analogy. Um, you know, in a way, we've got to sort of be aware that the numbers could be there before we start demanding the numbers, and we've got to have a kind of a sense of scale for what 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 compares with what. So that's one of the issues here. We have this product in the UK corn, which is mycoprotein. Uh, I can see some nodding in the US there maybe as well. And they have started to put those numbers um, available. So that's really, um, really interesting. Um, and also we have um, this Oatly oat milk drink where they've started to do this in the UK. Um, and I think Flora um, have started to do this as well. I've not seen one of these myself, but uh, this, is a, this is a picture of the packet. Confusingly, they're giving a slightly different metric per they're doing it per kilogram they're doing carbon dioxide per in, in 100 grams per point point five and it's 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 like this should have no units this number <laughs> it's the, the weight of carbon dioxide per weight of food right we don't need we don't need to have different units on the two quantities anyway i don't need to convince you guys of this okay and i believe that again this is another this is a restaurant has started to put these numbers on its uh, on its meals i've not seen this in person myself um could, could i in ask, fact, yeah please joshua how, what's what's the uncertainty on those numbers that you know if, if you ask a company to tell you how much it is how much leeway do they have in 
in coming up with that number you know what they have they're making assumptions about you know what kind of power was used in the processing and, and <laughs> are those numbers accurate to two digits or or not yeah good question no <laughs> so so one of the issues that comes up when i talk about this with people in industry is that um you know when when they when they're doing when they when they're producing all this food then it, they have different suppliers um those you know what mix of, of different grain has come from this country and that country and this hopper has got a, you know stuff going in the top but i don't know how much coming out the bottom is from this week's delivery or two weeks ago delivery um, there's a lot of practical questions which um which is not easy to answer on the other hand you know we do propagate a huge amount of data down the food supply chain at the moment and there is you know the technology is there to propagate data along uh, chains we we kind of do that all the time in in our in our work so it is possible to do it but it's not particularly easy and certainly to print one number on a packet assumes that that number is constant with time which of course it isn't um, so that what's happened here is that they've had an independent body come and examine their practices and come up with a sort of benchmark number which is you know going to be approximate and you can find lots of details in fact of all the different types of you know product here actually it varies quite a lot and it depends on whether you're looking at the factory gate or whether you're uh, including um, the shop refrigeration and freezing for example and there's a lot of um, emissions from refrigerants in, in supermarkets or whether you're going all the way to the consumer and including cooking um, so these there's a lot of different ways we can look at these numbers so I think on a practical level I'd be pretty happy if it was an example number um, and that was done by an independent body um, on the other hand, how amazing would that be if they could actually propagate it all the way down the, the supply chain and have it as a dynamic number that you could maybe barcode scan. Now, it, the numbers that I've been showing you on the previous slides in the graphics there, sometimes they do actually have, um, for some of those numbers, including beef, there's a range. So we can look at different regions of the world, but we can also look at different farming practices. And so depending on the farming practice, there, there are actually error bars on those numbers, well not error bars, but ranges on those numbers in those papers. And they are huge. Um, and they're, you know, um, I, can, I, can, I don't have it right now, but I can send you a link to a really nice graphic that shows a whole probability distribution function, effectively a histogram of all the different studies. And so you can see there that, you know, there's a lot of scope for improvement. Um, on the other hand, you still see this, this general trend that, that generally the animal products uh, don't tend to overlap with, with, with the, with the plant-based products a lot. I'll, I'll uh, dig at that okay. video. Can I ask a follow-up question on this? Yes, so um, it has two parts, I guess. Uh, one is, uh, do you foresee uh, that this is a growing part of the business sector for companies that do carbon uh, dioxide uh, impact based on manufacturing goods in different sectors? And who actually pays for uh, these assessments? Great question, yeah. Yeah, so it's gonna cost, it's gonna take people time and it's gonna take money to actually do all of these calculations. And I suppose that a company like Quorn or Oatly is very motivated to do that because they're, you know, that's part of their, their selling point is the fact that they are, you know, low emissions, but no one who's, you know, producing a high impact product is particularly going to want to spend the time or money doing it. And so that's why I think it has to be mandatory from governments. Uh, but also governments are going to have to produce money in order to contribute to that. I don't see how else we do it. Have you got any ideas? Uh, no, I was just curious. It looked like if this becomes um, mandatory by, by certain governments, then this could be a growing sector part of the business sector to do these assessments and get the accuracy absolutely yeah and there are but, some businesses you know, i'm sorry my internet's not very good sorry yeah so that's absolutely it is it is an, it is an industry which is which is growing and there are a few um so this cool farm tool this is actually one that's free for farmers but also they have you know if you're a big company using it then then i think you have to pay for that there's um, Carbon Trust is a UK um, government initiative, initiated project, which, which will do this for a fee for, for different companies. And there's this one called Mondra, which is actually set up by probably the world leader on, on, on 
publishing academic papers on, on this topic is also set up a business doing this. So it's definitely something to get into. Yeah, if you're looking for a, a good initiative, I'd recommend this. <laughs> Yeah, I, I mean, I think, you know, how important is it to do it? I mean, we, I just feel like, so some people have proposed having a meat tax, for example, and that would be one way of trying to sort of reduce emissions. Um, but at the same time, it feels deeply unfair because we've said there's a huge range depending on the, the method of production, but also, you know, different, different meats have different emissions as well. And I just really feel like it's unfair on the, especially the highest producing, um, at the highest impact uh, products, if we're just gonna penalize them ad hoc without really finding out the information and, and rewarding the great practices that a lot of people are already doing. So I have a somewhat different question, um, Sarah. Um, yep. It's of course, I think valid to look at our somewhat um, uh, overly generous lifestyle, including the food consumption that we uh, increasingly do. Um, but um, I, I recall having read uh, multiple times that one of the serious contributions to climate change in the food production globally is the fact that still about a third of the world population uses uh, wood and charcoal for cooking. And that that contributes very severely in, especially in developing countries with which I have a lot of population um, to deforestation and therefore in an indirect way to climate change. Uh, have you looked at this? Is this really relevant? Uh, because I mean, if we can, even if we could replace, um, you know, wood and charcoal with clean burning uh, hydrocarbon fuels, uh, that, that might uh, be more beneficial. Okay, yeah, that's a great question. Um, so I'm just going back to this incredibly detailed slide that I showed earlier. Here we go. Oh, did I not include? Okay, hold on. I have an even more detailed version of that slide, which I'm now going to show you. And we're going to look at it together and see if we can spot. Oh, it's not in here. Okay, let's just look at this one. Okay, so if we look on, whoops, if we look on here, then we can see some of the the cooking is on here, uh, so that would be on here. But I, I've never heard of that as being a big issue. So majority of land use change is driven by the fact that animals are relatively inefficient at ways of producing food. So on average, so, so the facts uh, are that about 83% of all farmland is used to produce animal products but animal products produce only 20% of our calories. So per calorie, if you think about that for a long time, per calorie, animal products require 16 times as much land than plant-based products to produce the same number of calories. And so that is what is driving deforestation at the moment. You can see the land use change here, but also these facts are just giving you about the amount of land that's used. So I'm not aware of wood burning for cooking being a major driver of deforestation, but I, I haven't looked at the exact numbers. So I'm, I'm really curious to look that up afterwards. Yeah, I can send you a link where I think I read that. Uh, but again, I mean, for somebody who's reading casually, it's not very easy to, uh, you know, ascertain uh, the relevance and the uh, truth of <laughs> these statements. Yeah, that's really interesting. Yeah, I mean, we've been looking at the cooking impacts actually in the UK. Um, and doing surveys actually in the US and, and other countries now, we're looking at the impact of cooking, but we haven't actually got a survey in a country where wood burning is a major contributor, but maybe there's, there's probably already studies on that. So let's have a look. Brilliant. Okay, good question. Thank you. I just Sarah, noticed, yes. That, you know, in, in other issues related to carbon, there, there are sort of efforts related to sort of carbon offsets and taxes where there's financial incentives to make things work. Like there's a really interesting Planet Money episode from a few months ago. People are going out and finding old CFC containers that used to be used in um, refrigerants, which have an enormous impact. And they're basically almost cheating and telling people they just want to use it for something else so they can get it and then sell it and destroy it. And I, I was just wondering, are there any sort of economic sort of carbon markets or offset ideas that could, it seems like a much harder way 
sort of venue in terms of food to approach that kind of that kind of way of doing things. Are there any ideas of doing that sort of thing where somehow it'd be advantageous to build economies where people try to get carbon out of the system and get rewarded for it? Yeah, so I mean, I'm sure we've all heard of the kind of dodgy carbon offsetting projects where they kind of say they're going to plant some trees and then they don't or they were going to plant them anyway. So does it really count? Um, in terms of, um, you know, the most exciting kind of uh, and most promising kind of carbon, uh, it's not offsetting, but the most most promising thing probably along the lines of what you're interested in is, is, is carbon capture and storage, um, which you may have heard of. So this idea that we're going to uh, burn stuff, it could be biofuels, for example, um, so it could be wood or it could be um, a perennial grass and there's uh, various different perennial grass, that, so grasses that stay in the soil for a long period of time and build up carbon in the soil uh, and then they're harvested uh, at the top and then burnt. And one of the ways that you could do that is you could actually capture the carbon dioxide coming out of that uh, process. If you could capture that carbon dioxide and put it under the ground, and if there happened to be some empty uh, bits of, uh, of the underground now from where we dug out the fossil fuels. Um, so there's, there's places we could put this carbon dioxide that would help to reduce uh, climate change. And that could be a real you know, benefit to climate change generally, if we could figure out how to do that. Um, there's kind of a division in the sort of uh, scientific community, I would say on, on that because um, you know, whether you should rely on something which has not really been tested at scale, whether we should really be pumping stuff under the ground, that we, it, it feels a little bit risky. Um, and also, you know, whether we should really be pinning all our hopes on something that doesn't really involve transformation of what we're doing and the way that we do things. Um, it's not really clear that we can solve it, solve climate change. We can't solve climate change by just sticking stuff under the ground. We've also got to stop burning the fossil fuels in the first place. So. So that's the most promising kind of route, but on the other hand, it's a bit controversial. I'm just noticing the time, so I'm gonna stop uh, talking. I'm just gonna share one last thing, which is just where you can download a whole load of free tools if you're interested in doing more stuff on this. I'm just gonna whiz through to that slide and leave that up. So we've got this project called Take a Bite Out of Climate Change, where you can play a little game online and and, and guess which food causes the most climate change. Um, and you can download these flashcards, there's 72 of them, and you can can uh, can play top trumps with them. And the kids kids seem to like this sort of thing um, and, and look at all the numbers there. And all of those numbers are all in a spreadsheet if you wanna have a play with those. Um, and you can see all the original references there. So this website, um, Take a Bite Out of Climate Change, is a place you could go if you're interested in, in finding out more. I think I should wrap up. Thank you ever so much for all your fantastic questions. That was really, really fun. Well, thank you for a, for a very stimulating talk. Um, and um, I'm sure there are more questions to be asked. So um, usually after a colloquium, we open the floor first to questions from graduate students. So if there are graduate students um, or undergraduate students with questions, um, now's a good time to ask. I have a question. Yeah. Um, so a lot of that, I mean, you've given us reason to take a lot of actions, um, but that can also scare me. What mm -hmm. can be like, what, what do you recommend is like one action that I can take? Great question. Um, yeah, I would look at quantities. I would look at things that you eat. Reg if you want to take individual action about your own individual diet, then I would say look at the things that you eat regularly don't worry about the things that you have on a one-off basis at christmas or whatever you know don't worry about that piece of cake and aren't made with an egg in it fine eat it you know not that we can with covid but anyway look at the things you eat regularly and look at quantities and instead of focusing on say reducing the amount of something look at bulking out with stuff that is you know like vegetables uh, season you know seasonal vegetables and um pulses look at ways that you could add things rather than thinking about depriving yourself of something if you make a spaghetti bolognese and add extra vegetables and a tin of lentils you're going to eat less beef so if if it's you know it's a much more positive way of looking at it i would say look at quantities that's all in terms of individual action anyway i like that a lot thank you thank you other questions from students 
let's open it up to to anybody. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't allow time for this bit. Sorry, yeah. <laughs> No, no, th this was supposed to be an add-on to the, uh, unless you have to go get your own dinner, <laughs> we're, we're fine. No, no, it's, uh, <laughs> my, my beans are perfectly fine. <laughs> I have a question. And I guess sort of when I think about the, all the messages you, you gave us, the kind of two take-home messages that seem to be the biggest to me are uh, in the choice of, of diet, you know, avoid, avoid beef. And uh, in the uh, in the general changes in the in the whole industry, uh, avoid or uh, go to green energy for for everything, transport, cooking, and, and heating. So, isn't it sort of maybe more efficient to to not worry about the noise that all these things? It could be this, could be that, depends, and, and all that. But sort of focus on the big. The, I mean, maybe there's some, some more than that. But but I mean, these seem to be the biggest that that would make actually bring bring that bar probably down to the three thousand. Per day. Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, I suppose that on a practical level, how do you make a change to a to, to I mean, we're used to saying let's look at the big fit, big things and, and focus on those first. And I and I and I would agree with with that. On the other hand, I guess we've got a transition period and we've got some places which you know really do depend on on cows as their livelihoods as well as just um you know uh, a source of food. Uh you know the quantities I think have to change I, I don't think it's correct that we have to be absolute absolutist about it I don't think we have to say never drink milk and never eat beef I don't think it's very helpful um I, I think it comes to sort of a social science question and I'm really excited to be just starting a project working with social scientists now because how do you how do you get a transformation in the food system um do you get that by saying let's just stop doing a few things that you know, beef is the biggest, um, the most profitable part of UK food production. Um, it's it's not popular to say we're going to stop uh, eating beef, and I, I I imagine the US would be similar. So um, I think we've got to find ways of 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 having these conversations and getting people to look at the numbers. And you know, if people draw that conclusion for themselves, then I'm 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 not going to disagree with it. But at the same time. We've got to bring people along with us. And I think that having a conversation about the numbers and getting the facts out is the only way I know to do that. Could I ask one more question? Um, the, the other class of foods that we eat a lot of are drinks um, and you know, juices and and um, sodas, whatever. I mean, we know sugar is bad <laughs> for for other reasons. But um, when you think about drinks, the thing I think about most is the transportation costs. You know, there like is it substantially better to have frozen orange juice, you know, from concentrate than to have you know the the nice stuff that you pour right out of a carton. And it's ready to go. Um, are there? Are, is there anything in that sector that makes a big difference? Okay, uh, so I've just put up orange juice. <laughs> um, so yeah, so it does make a difference if you concentrate it and then transport the concentrate rather than uh, transporting the unconcentrated juice. Um, there are studies which have compared those. In fact, you can find the the references to those studies um, in the copious end notes um, here which I, I don't know if I'll be able to find. Oh, here we go. So you'll be able to find this, this paper here, which actually has different values for whether it's, um, whether it's been uh, concentrated before transport or um, whether it's been transported without concentrate. In general, if we look at these numbers, let's go back to that. So I guess we've got orange juice in a small plastic bottle. So that's about 400 grams. And we were trying to get fit in a daily budget of about 3000 grams. Um, so it's, it's, you know, it'd be nice to reduce that, but at the same time, it's probably not most people's first thing they should look at, unless they're having a lot, obviously, which might lead to health issues. Stephen. Uh, yeah, so uh, uh, I think one, one of the fascinating numbers that, that I learned today was this factor of six in terms of the land usage per calorie, per calorie equivalent uh, animal products versus, versus vegetable. Um, can fit into that? How, how do fish uh, compare? Because of course it's 
it's it's not land based. Um, how how does one work that in? Yeah. Okay. I'm just trying to find the relevant slide for that. Uh, so people like this numbers slides. I'm just going to bring that up. Better slides. Here we go. Okay, so this is um, showing per gram of for 45 grams of protein, what's the greenhouse gas emission? So that's like one chicken breast. Um, so you can see fish here. So you can see two different types of fish. So you can see salmon here and cod. These are kind of typical numbers here salmon, uh, typical numbers for farmed fish. So that's aquaculture, that's where you're actually, you know, you're growing this fish, you're giving them food. And that's actually a very similar number to chicken. And that's not a coincidence because a large fraction of that is coming from producing the food to feed to the fish. Now cod is, it, this number here is a typical number for caught fish. So we're sending out boats and we're fishing and then we're hauling it in and then we're refrigerating it, freezing it. And then we're, 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 dry, we're sailing those boats back again. And that number is mostly coming from the diesel um, that's used for the gas that's used on those, those boats. So it's a kind of coincidence that, that comes out anything like these other numbers. Um, in terms of land use, I guess um, your question would be about um, land use of, of stuff like uh, chicken and salmon would be relevant in terms of the, the, the amount of area of land that's used to produce the food. And, and obviously there'd be no land use associated with the cod. Does that answer your question? Yes, I'm going to buy more cod. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> is, is pork more like um, more like uh, chicken or more like lamb and beef? That's a good question. It's about halfway between uh, logarithmically, I think. Uh, let's just uh, double check that. Okay, so we've got pork. So ham here is a typical pork number. Um, so you can see that it's it's not as low as as the chicken, but it's it's you know significantly lower than the lamb. I see. I didn't see the ham. Okay, thanks. Yeah, I didn't. So that's mostly coming from the, the food, but also the manure management in that case. And one more question about uh, this, this uh, uh, personal choice in a way, or lifestyle choice. And in another talk on climate change, I, uh, I saw statistics, but I don't remember the exact numbers, but it was showing that concrete is a huge contributor uh, to, to, this, uh, to the climate change, which I thought was comparable or even larger than the effect of food. Is, is that right or? Yeah, concrete is a huge wrong. thing. I'm just going back to that uh, that nice Sankey diagram. Um, so concrete, the issue there is that in the process, in the production of concrete, then we end up with uh, producing carbon dioxide that comes out of the production. So you can see uh, it should be here somewhere. I'm just looking for the line for concrete uh, construction. So part of this it seemed small, and, and I, I remember it was sort of a big fraction of the whole pie. So, so that's why I'm okay. confused. Okay. Well, this is the kind of this is the kind of thing that I've been seeing. I've got a more detailed version of this that I'll dig out, which will probably I think has an actual specific line, you know, mentioning concrete production. Um, but it is, you know, it's a surprisingly large amount. I think even so on this on this diagram. I guess it depends on what it was a fraction of. Maybe it was a fraction of of, of CO two, or maybe it's a fraction of of something else. Kate, you have a question? Yeah, I have one question. Just generally, how how can you compare um, cooking something from ingredients at home with buying something comparable already cooked and packaged, like the spaghetti bolognese? Would it is it better to assemble that yourself at home, or buy a frozen version and put it in the microwave? Yeah, great question. And there have been studies looking specifically at this. And uh, yeah, it does depend a lot on how you're cooking it at home. Um, so if you're putting it in the microwave, um, you know, if you're using the microwave or if you're boiling up things on the stove, I've got an example actually that I, I could show you, but I, I won't for the time, reason the time, looking at say uh, beans, if you cook beans at home, um, in a, uh, boiling it up on a pan for half an hour, or whether you're gonna do that in a, in a slow cooker or, or a pressure cooker compared with a tin. And depending on which of those things you do at home, it can either be more or less than buying it in a can. So it's 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 generally more efficient to, to, to cook things in bulk and to reheat them. Um, so it could it should in general be more efficient to get the things already you know um, bought. But then there's lots of other issues about health and, and, and the sort of salt con content of processed foods and so on. So in, in specifics, it's not always that simple. Andrew. Yeah, so I'm, this is a little bit higher level, but I'm curious to hear your thoughts. Do you think that this is necessarily a mostly 
you know, behavioral movement or like the changes that we need to make will be the product of people changing their behaviors? Or is there, you know, significant room for technologies like, uh, like anaerobic digesters, for example, to come and allow us to maintain this level of consumption, but significantly bring down the adverse effects of it? Yeah, I mean, I started this whole thing excited, excited about what technology can do. You know, I, I love I love the idea that technology could could sort all this out. And my original idea actually was that I was going to use image analysis techniques to improve crop yields by using satellite data of fields. And I actually did use the same piece of code at one point to analyze um, a galaxy and, and also a field. Uh, we've got multiple wave bands and we've got, you know, we've got shapes we want to measure and we want to, you know, look at spectra and, you know, this, this all this stuff just seemed like an amazing opportunity to use all this, you know, the data analysis stuff that we were doing in cosmology. And I was even, you know, trying to figure out if we could look at the shapes of things. But uh, anyway, it turns out that, you know, if we improve all of this stuff, um, we can get maybe 10, 20 percent, 30 percent improvement in terms of greenhouse gas emissions um, if we if we, you know, um, optimize lots of different bits of technology. Anaerobic digesters is a great example of something that is really transformational in that respect. Um, but at the same time, you know, we've got a third of food being um, wasted. If we could anaerobically digest all of that, well, is that better or worse than just not making that food in the first place? Um, because obviously that causes emissions that we could do without. So um, my conclusion gradually became that actually behavioral change, you know, this factor of 20, I mean, wow, you know, we can we can, we can make factors of several by changing what we're eating, um, comes out to be, you know, have a lot more potential, I think, in terms of greenhouse gas emissions. But of course it's, you know, how do we, how do we bring this up? That's not clear. So maybe we can close with one one final question. I, I'm curious whether you, how you found the transition as a scientist from cosmology to to this field. Um, do you feel like you're doing the same thing day to day, just on a different subject, or are you in a different um, professional mode? I have to be careful how I answer this because I get into trouble if I sound too happy. <laughs> I don't want to, I don't want to upset anybody. Um, now let me let me let me ask. I don't know who shall I ask. I don't know Troxel. What what do you do day to day? Do you, how much time do you spend doing data analysis? And <laughs> uh, that, that's a dangerous question to ask me because most of my day is on Zoom calls, not doing uh, any data work at all. Right, exactly. That's my point. I mean, that, that's where you, you know, you know, you know, that's where I was uh, when you were in Manchester, and and uh, you know, projects don't work unless there are people like you were then doing all of the, the hard work and making making everything add up. But uh, also, we need people who who do um, you know know how to to hopefully coordinate things uh, well and get get people working together and and work out how we're going to structure all of these things. Uh, you know that's what I was doing in cosmology uh, and that's what I'm doing now and you know we need people who are good at you know talking and understand what we do right now is we're trying to make a physical model a quantitative systems model of the food system um, which is kind of a crazy idea because it is a pretty complicated system but we're also so we're working with stakeholders like farmers we're talking about what interventions they could do on their fields. We're talking to the food system, the food production, processing, manufacturers, interventions they can do there. We're working with school canteens. And we're looking at changes they can make to their menu. We're talking to the kids and talking to them about what they want, changing the food environment. For example, where you place the vegan options versus the meat options versus, you know, how do you actually lay those out in a canteen? It's not just about getting people to choose things uh, differently off their own bat. So all of these different interventions we can model how those impact on the greenhouse gas emissions, the healthiness of what we're eating and the social and, and ethical uh, outcomes of those things. So we're trying to do this crazy quantitative systems model. And I'm currently actually about to put an advert out for a postdoc to come and work on this with me in with a big six million uh, pound uh, project uh, in the UK, working with uh, stakeholders across like including the UK government on how do we transform the UK food system. So. Yeah, I, I would say that it's not as different as I thought it would be. 
um, uh, a lot of these skills about trying to write emails that don't annoy people and <laughs> giving talks are pretty transferable. Um, but I did spend about three years going to every meeting that I went to and saying, hello, I'm an astrophysicist. Tell me about your food thing. Uh, about 95% of the time, people thought I was completely crazy. And, and it took a long time to, you know, uh, keep just I just had to, I just knew I had to keep doing it because I really wanted to do it. But um, at the same time, you have to be prepared to have 95% of people look at you and think, <laughs> are you crazy? And the 5% who get it are amazing. And they're the only people that matter. Well, thanks so much for uh, spending some time with us. Um, I, I thought it was fascinating, and let's let's all thank Professor Bridal. Thank you. <laughs> thanks so, very much. For having so me. well on Zoom, um, but you you can imagine the clapping sounds. <laughs> <laughs> brilliant. Um, thank you so much. It's brilliant. I hope everybody had a good lunch or is about to, um, and that you make good choices when you do. <laughs> Um, th thanks again very much. That's a pleasure. Thank you all for coming. I'll stop the recording now and people can hang on.